So um, welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk on how to become an IoT developer and have fun. Uh, just first off, a, a little bit about me. Oh, good, that's working. Um, so I, my name's Justin McLean. I'm a board member. I'm also the VP of the Apache Incubator. Uh, but the reason why I'm giving this talk is that I'm interested in IoT and IoT development, and I've, I've done a, a a little bit of that in, in recent time and a little bit of that in my past as well, which I'll go into a little more detail on. I'm also on several PMCs at the Apache Software Foundation and mentor of several projects, projects and I've reviewed hundreds of releases at Apache. So um, you may have come across me when I've uh, voted minus one on one of your releases. So first off, um, a little bit about my background and how I actually got here. I've been coding since the 80s, and I started out in low-level machine code uh, and C programming. And I worked on a lot of uh, very early IoT projects, and they weren't called IoT back then. They were, they were different things, but they were basically what we would call IoT now. Uh, and, and then as my career progressed, this thing called the internet came along. Uh, and open source hardware came along, and I sort of got interested back in it again. I, I, I thought, well, you know, I actually really like working on that hardware stuff, and I haven't done that for, you know, 15, 20 years, uh, and I was sort of wondering what has changed, and I got involved with uh, some hobbyist platforms, such as the Adreno platform, uh, and I, I got interested in that, and I started running talks uh, at ApacheCon and, uh, and other conferences on, on that. And I started up the IoT Sydney meetup, which has now been going for, for more than five years. Um, and then I sort of come full circle again and started working back, working back on hardware and coding in C. Um, more recently, I'm actually writing content for IoT courses as well. So, so it's sort of a nice little journey that's, that's, that's I started off, well, I finished basically where I started off, which is a, a, a fun thing to have. Um, and during that time, things have certainly changed. Uh, and I'm going to list out just a, a few of the major changes here. Uh, the biggest change is the fact that you can now have access to very low cost, easy to program hardware. Uh, the hardware used to be really expensive. Uh, and you also couldn't program it that easily. You actually physically had to take the chip out of the, the thing, put it into an EEPROM burner. Um, burn it, that would take 15 minutes or so. Uh, you'd also have to erase the chip under ultraviolet light. Um, so uh, these days you just can plug in a USB cable and, and send the program across or we'll even do it over the air uh, by, by some means. So that is one of the major things that changed and it's made it much more accessible. We also have a, a lot more modern development tools and IDE. Uh, some of these are maybe not quite as modern as you're used to, in, in, depending on what you're coding. But uh, there's been improvements there. Um, there's also been some standardization in, in, in the way that you talk to things and, and the interfaces you use and, and things along those lines. So if you've worked in one platform, you've, you've got skills that are transferable across to others. Um, and then there's this the whole open source hardware and software communities that, that have risen up and um, make your life so much more easy. Uh, it's, you know, you don't have to constant re constantly reinvent the wheel, uh, but, you know, other people have gone and done all the hard work for you and you can, you can use their hard work to, to do more interesting things. But there's one thing that hasn't changed, and, and that is that hardware is hard. Uh, you can't revert changes quickly uh, once because it's a physical thing. Once it's made, it's made, uh, and you, you you can't undo that trace on the on the board. Uh, and you can't you know change it once 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 it's out there in the field. You might be able to change the software on it, uh, but that is a different thing entirely. People also often underestimate the time taken to develop hardware. 
uh, it can take a lot longer than you think. And and a lot of this is going to be in some of the complexities, low level complexities of it. And some of this is just in basic debugging because it's harder to find and debug errors. Um, you often have no real insight into what's going on in the hardware. Uh, you, and in some cases, you know, you can't set breakpoints, you can't step through the code and do some of the other things that you would be used to doing in other environments. Uh, and the last thing is that uh, I've already mentioned is that it can sometimes be very hard to update the software on these devices. Uh, and that that is a topic that I could spend an entire presentation on. So hopefully you came along to this talk because you are or you want to be a, an IoT developer. And so what is an IoT developer? Well, it's, it's sort of one name, different jobs. It's the IoT has sort of uh, lost a bit of its hype or the shine on its name. Uh, and it now means a lot of different things. And IoT is going to be in everyday projects. And so you can actually be an IoT developer without touching any hardware at all. You can be writing the software that, that um, you know, collates all the data uh, from it and uh, shows a nice dashboard of what's going on and so forth. Um, if you want to see something along those lines, uh, go to Chris's talk, which is up next. And yeah, so you, you can not do the hardware itself. So what I'm going to focus on in this talk is that you want to actually do something with the hardware and discover a little more about how hardware works and focus on the more embedded side of it, but from a software point of view. So you'll actually be writing software that will run on these devices. So how can you actually get into this field and what some of the things you can do to you know, start to get interested in this and start learning about it? Well, the thing I like most is you can uh, play with toys. Um, just get yourself one of these cheap development boards, um, an Adreno or a Raspberry Pi or something similar along those lines, and, and uh, think of a project that interests you. Now, this can be as simple as just some blinking LEDs, or it can be monitoring your garden's climate, you know, working out when you need to water your plants, um, displaying your favorite team's sports scores, hooking it up to Twitter, or whatever. Or, you know, if you're into beer brewing, then, then you know, controlling the temperature of your brew and, and logging what's going on. So, and, and just pick something that interests you and just play around with it. Because if you, if you have a personal interest in it, you're more likely to uh, put some time and effort into it, and, and you'll actually get a lot more out of it. I was just looking at Chris's chest there. Yes, uh, the, the, the print line is uh, blinking lights in, in, in the IT world. <laughs> So um, you know, the Adreno board, if you haven't seen them, uh, looks something like this. This is a, a, a reasonably old one, uh, but it's a good prototyping board to starting out with. It's very robust and rugged. Uh, you can turn things on and off with it. Uh, it has analog inputs as well. Um, and yeah, the, you, the, thing, the thing you learn most about playing with one of these is that it's actually really hard to break. Uh, and and that you can do quite a lot a lot with a combination of hardware and software. The IDE itself for, for the Adreno, there's a there's a new cloud IDE as well. Um, ESP 32s, well the like are, are also a good platform to, to play with them. I just noticed a comment in the chat there. Um, and and this is sort of a typical code. Uh, that you could sort of write an ID. This is very simple, you know, just making some lights blink or changing the color of some some lights. Um, well, the first part of the code anyway there. So um, what I like about this ID is that it's not complex. It's only got a few buttons up the top. You just write your code there. Most of your programs are very simple uh, and it, it's very easy to upload and test and, and, and run stuff. So once you've sort of played around with this a, a, a little bit, what you might want to do is start thinking about creating some of your own circuits. And so you want to get a, a breadboard and some wires and, and wire up a simple circuit and, and try and then, you know, maybe create a prototype out of that and get it working 
Um, and you may now start to need to look into, you know, some slight, getting some slight more skills in basic electronics. Uh, and you might have to get yourself a multimeter to, to, to work out what's going on or what's going wrong with your your, your circuit there. Um, and there's sort of two styles when it comes to creating breadboards and wires. One is cutting all the wires nice to length. The other is making it look like a rat's nest. I will think you can guess which one I go with. Uh, so anyway, so here's a simple breadboard with some, some LEDs um, and some resistors on it. So just to limit the current to the LEDs. Uh, there's nothing complex here. If you want to do a little more than that when you first start out, then a good idea is to use breakout boards. And there's lots of companies that will actually make these boards and, and you can buy them quite easily and cheaply, depending depending on what they do. Uh, and there's there's literally hundreds of thousands of them involved. And these boards are pre-assembled. They'll have some sort of chip on them that has a specific purpose. They'll often have a standard interface that you can communicate with the chip with say I, I squared C or SPI. And you can basically think of them as Lego blocks and you can plug all these different blocks together and make your own project up that can have quite a lot of functionality and complexity to it uh, just from using a few standard off the shelf breakout boards. So uh, here's a little air quality uh, control board here. And, and here's a, uh, uh, a breakout, a whole lot of breakout boards connected to, um, that's actually a, a particle uh, board there, but it's uh, similar to, a, to an Adreno um, or an RSP, uh, ESP32. So the next thing, you actually want to turn this into something permanent because uh, breadboards are great for making prototypes, but they're, you, they're not really very rugged. The wires come out easily. Um, and so the next thing you want to do is, is to, to learn how to solder. Um, and it's actually a lot easier than you think. You just need to use the right tools and, and in particular, the right tip. You, you need a, you know, a small, properly sized tip. Um, and I would start off with large through hole items first rather than going straight down the surface mount path. Um, once you get a little practice with larger components, you can then try smaller components. And it actually involves different soldering techniques to, to solder these together. Um, there's lots of great useful information online that you can find out how to do this and, and videos that you can see of people showing you how to do this. One thing you should learn really early on is how to correct your mistakes. Um, and, and that will save you a lot of time and effort because you will make mistakes when, 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 you, when you start out. Using a flux pen will certainly help make your life a lot easier. And also uh, when you start first using ICs, uh, when you're first starting to use, getting your soldering skills together, you'll tend to hold the iron to things for a little too long and they'll get overheated. And that can possibly damage some ICs. So it's a good idea to use sockets and then just plug the ICs into them. Uh, but electronics are actually getting more and more robust as time goes on. Uh, and it's actually reasonably hard to damage uh, a lot of modern electronics. So once you've put your skills to use there, you can actually come up with a, a prototype. Um, so this is just using a prototype uh, board here uh, with a couple of components soldered onto it. Um, and you can see it's still looking a bit like the breadboard there in that I've just soldered some wires uh, that were looping across the, the surface of the board there. So once you've got this, you wanted to do something, and the, the whole point of this is that you want to write some code that, that goes on it. Um, and in most cases, you probably need to use uh, a, a new language. And most boards uh, will actually use C. Uh, some will use C++. And there's a few other platforms that exist as well. So uh, there are boards which you can actually code Python or MicroPython on, and you can also uh, there's a couple of boards that you can use JavaScript, but uh, C is not too hard to learn. Uh, and the sort of programs that you're going to be writing here uh, are, are not going to be that complex. Uh, um, uh, and you'll get, you'll actually learn a lot by using a, a language that, that has uh, uh, pointers and memory management. 
I know Chris is in the in the chat there will probably disagree with me because he's uh, recently had to write some C and he, I don't think he was enjoying it at all. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he's replied, not really. <laughs> So you may have need to forget some of the, the stuff that you need that you've already learned. You know, you need to unlearn some stuff in order to learn learn something something new. Um, C is not as complicated as you may think, uh, and in particular, the way that modern C is written is a little different to uh, how you may have come across it in the in the past. So. Uh, yeah, just just take that on board, and and it's always good learning new stuff anyway. So here's like again, a, like here's a very simple Adreno program, and what this does is that um, it sets up a pin, in this case pin ten, to be an output. That's in the setup function there, and then in the loop function, it's just turning that pin off, waiting half a second, then turning that pin on and waiting half a second. So this will make a little let blink. This is basically the hello world of, of the IoT world. So if you want to learn a little more about C, then what you should do is um, possibly go back and read one of the classics. This is the KNR C programming language manual. Um, this will contain just about everything you need to know. But it is, as I said, a little dated. And C has gone through uh, a few more modern revisions. Uh, and I would recommend maybe this book as well. So C has, has definitely improved. Um, and there's a couple of different flavors. Oops. Skipped a slide there. No, no, I, for some reason I've managed to put one down there. Um, so there's a whole lot of different different versions of C. Um, so you need to decide which one you're, you're going to go with. In some cases, that my choice may have been made for you by the, the architecture of the board or whatever. Uh, C99 seems to be a good base set of features, and it's added a few more um, things that you may not have run into if you're used to old style K and RC, things like um, different Boolean and int types, uh, auto sizing of arrays, which is which is quite nice. It's got support for floating point numbers, uh, in this case, uh, I triple E seven five four version, uh, and also inline functions, which which is which is sort of nice. Um, you do when you start out is you may want to avoid dynamic allocation of memory altogether. Uh, you, you may not have a choice, but it may be a good way to do it. So you can basically pre-allocate everything that you need, um, and that way you know that you're not going to have issues with running out of memory or uh, you know, other issues along those lines. Um, also, just be careful with using pointers. These may be a new thing to you, and you may run into some some trouble. And I would just try and keep the code as simple as possible, and not try to do anything fancy. You can always improve the performance, uh, you know, later if it's needed. Um, definitely, don't uh, try and optimize things too early. Um, you can also encapsulate all the hard bits, you know, um, and and make sure that you can get those working with a clean API, and then it makes it a lot, lot easier to, to, to use in the rest of the program. And there's a few things that you need to take care of in terms of, uh, in terms of memory management. Most of these constrained systems have very small amounts of memory. You want to make sure that you're not using up too much memory, so using the, the appropriate size integers is a, is a good thing to do. And you need to take care with strings in C because these are null terminated, so they've got a, a special character at the end of the string, uh, and it's quite easy to, to mess that up and not put the null on the end or go off the end of the string or do other, other horrible things along those lines. However, I've been talking about these, these things, systems being constrained, not having a lot of memory, but you can do 
an awful lot in a small amount of memory. So on the Adreno, for example, you can write a web server in about 20 lines of code, and that compiles down to 2K in size. So it's, um, it's quite amazing what you can do on these things. Now, you're not going to be able to serve videos or anything like that off, off, off that platform. Uh, but it's good enough to have a little interface that you can communicate with or talk to or, or even serve some web pages off from. So by this point, you, you're going to need to know some some electronic basics, and this will this will definitely help you in your in your path here. Um, and most of the things you're going to be dealing with is is digital logic, not analog logic. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, digital electronics, not analog electronics. So um, generally, this is means either five volts or three three point three volts is one, and naught volts is zero. Um, and that, that's pretty easy to to, to to understand and get used to. Um, and then you're going to get into you know a few basic techniques and and in, in building circuits about how you can limit currents to to LED so they glow with the right brightness. How to use transistors for switching, uh, turning things on and off. Um, if you were using a few ICs, you need uh, cap capacitors to 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 make sure that their power supplies are, are, are constant. Um, and also, if you're using switches, you need to use pull up or pull down resistors, uh, so they actually work as switches and give proper logic levels of, of you know uh, one and zero, and not indeterminate values, which can uh, totally screw things up. Um, and sometimes voltage dividers are, are useful. But once you know most of those things there, and all these are very very simple, uh, and you can you can look look them up, um, you'll be well on your way to to, to making some of your own circuits and so forth. Once you start using some of these components, uh, these will, will come with data sheets. Uh, and you'll need to learn a little bit about how to read a data sheet and look for what the important values are in there. Now, don't be so concerned if you don't understand all of it. Uh, you probably don't need to know all of it. They often contain uh, far more data than you actually need. And um, you're only interested in a few things that in your use. For, for example, if you look at a data sheet for a LED, you want to know uh, what the forward voltage of it is, uh, so you know what the voltage drop is across the LED, and you want to know, you know how much power it's going to consume. And once you know those two things, you, you, can, you can work out you know, the value of the resistor, for example, for, for limiting current through it. Um, quite often, these data sheets will contain sample circuits and that's a great thing because it means they've gone off and done the work for you and can show you how, to, how you can actually use something. Uh, in some cases they're going to provide timing information and that's going to be useful if you're programming something and generally you can you can actually with something like the Adreno because they run reasonably fast you can actually use what's called a, a bit banging technique uh, and actually simulate this timing where just by turning digital inputs on and off very fast, uh, and you don't have to um, do it so precisely, and, and you'll still be able to get away with, with things working. Just be careful that data sheets can vary a lot in quality, um, and sometimes they can even be misleading. Um, so if you buy random bits off eBay, uh, and um, they may not even come with a data sheet, or if they do, the data sheet may not even be for that, for that part. So once you get to this stage and going a little further, you're going to have to learn how to read a circuit diagram. And you just need to know at this point the, the basic symbols and how to match up pins on ICs, integrated circuits, so you know how to hook them up um, on your breadboard or in your, you know, your prototype. So here's a, a little sample schematic of an IC. Um, this just shows it's an accelerometer, I believe. And it's just got a couple of extra components there, including um, some capacitors, and, and that's about it. Uh, but each of those pins there means something, and if you look at the data sheet, those pins will tell you what you need to do uh, and how you need to connect them up. So by this stage, um, you've, you've made things on breadboards, you've made things on prototyping boards, you can actually make a PCB. Um, and, and this is actually, you know, why should you do this? It's fun, and it's actually quite cheap. 
Um, these days you can get like 10 boards made, you know, reasonable side boards, and we're talking simple boards, just single, uh, double-sided boards. Uh, 10 boards done for about $10. Uh, I would suggest you start out with a basic PCB layout program, something like Fritzing. Uh, there are other open source ones around as well, that are uh, uh, CAD, for example, which are more complex, uh, but they're going to take longer to learn. Uh, and you may, that may be a stumbling block. Um, so Fritzing will do some basic checks for you. Um, it's got a breadboard layout and a circuit layout and a PCB layout. And you can switch between all three of them, which is really nice. And if you make changes in one, it will make changes in the other. Uh, and particularly when you're starting out, that's a great help. Um, and there's just a few things you need to be, to be aware of when you're laying out these boards. Um, it's that you don't want to cross the tra tracks because that causes a short circuit. Um, and sometimes you can actually go between the, the top layer of the board and the bottom layer of the board via a little via. Uh, and that's the way you can connect things between the two boards. Um, and you also need to understand about ground fill and copper fill because you don't you you don't want to etch all the copper off the board because that's that's wasteful. Um, but again, all of this is is fairly straightforward and, and would you know most people could be able to put a board together like the one I've shown there in a space of half a day from knowing nothing at all. So this is what the, the board looks like when you made it. And then once you've sold everything up, um, you'll find that hopefully it works. <laughs> so some things to, to, to be uh, careful of is there's always a temptation to use small, cheap surface mount components and to really miniaturize things and go small. Um, this keeps the costs down, uh, but it makes the devices a lot, lot harder to debug. And you may make a few mistakes in you know your, your first device, um, and it also makes it almost well, it makes it hard or sometimes even impossible to make modifications to the board. If you uh, make a, a mistake on a on a, a larger board, you can easily just get a knife and cut a track, or you can solder some wires together, uh, or, or something along those lines to correct some mistakes. But the smaller you get, the harder it is to 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 do that. And also, the the boards may also have higher de defect rates. Um, uh, particularly when you're starting out and you may not understand all the tolerances and, and what you need to do to, to, to make boards of that size. Um, another good thing uh, you can do is uh, don't use the hardware at all. Actually, just write all your compo code and compile it and test it locally. Uh, because you're just writing C, standard C works just about everywhere. Um, and you know, your laptop is going to be a lot, lot faster than the development board you're working on, and it's also going to be a lot easier to debug. Um, you've probably got a nicer IDE. You can step through things. You can set breakpoints. Now, in this case, you, you're probably going to mean you can, you're can you going to have to stub things out or you're going to have to, you know, make some assumptions there. And there are some, there's certainly some stuff that you're not going to be able to code uh, without using the actual hardware. Um, it also means you can write unit tests for all your stuff, uh, uh, and that means you 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 can get about eighty percent done, and you have a really good idea that it's going to work well. And then what you do is you go off and test it on on the actual hardware, because um, at some point it's going to run on the real hardware, so you've, you've got to test it there. Now, with modern hardware and modern IDEs in this environment, most so most of them, well, not all of them, but most of them will actually support. Uh, modern debugging, and they can, you know, you can set breakpoints, set through the code line by line, and you can do other things as, as well. Uh, the one thing you want to do is you you want to test release builds as well as uh, debug builds and make sure that things are, are working on the, on the release version and the debug version. Um, don't forget that you also want to test your hardware. You you need to have some way of testing that, and there's a few options that you can do. Uh, one is you want to have some sort of boot up sequence on the on the hardware when the power is first applied, and that will check that a couple of things are working and possibly give some feedback uh, to indicate if something's gone wrong. That may just be you know uh, blinking a LED or changing the color of the LED to tell you what's what's happening there. Um, you can also put physical test points on the board itself to make it easier to, to, 
to measure currents and voltages so you can make sure that, that things are working properly. Um, and if you're making a large number of boards, uh, what you want to do is you want to make up a test rig that has the, they're called pogo pins and they push down on all the test points. And that way you can, you can test large amounts of boards quite quickly. With these constrained systems, um, you want to watch out for your memory, uh, like, you know, 32K or 128K or even a meg may sound like that, that, that uh, it's a, a lot, uh, but you can run out of memory. As I said before, try when starting out, try avoid dynamically allocating memory if possible. Um, and often if you're using a, a, you know, a slightly more complex board, you might be using a real-time operating system. And they generally have ways of showing you memory usage and memory usage over time. And some of them have more advanced features like um, stack overflow guards and, and other things like that will, will help you do this. But one thing you should definitely really do is do a burn-in test and have, your, have your, your prototype running for, you know, say 24 hours or so um, to make sure that the memory doesn't climb over time and that everything is in, in good working order. Um, you're going to run into bugs, and um, generally, it's always the software that it's fault. Um, if something doesn't work, it's going to be the software, not the hardware. Um, and if you can't find the bug, it's still likely to be your software. And it's not likely to be in that library used by thousands of people. It's going to be in your software. So you know, 99% of the time, it's going to be something that you've done wrong. Um, so um, except uh, when it is actually the hardware. <laughs> and there's some good news here is in that um, generally what happens is it just it won't work at all. So the hardware won't even power up uh, or it'll have a short and consume all the power and probably let out some magic smoke uh, and you'll have a dead board. Um, if you're very unlucky, it will mostly work. And I, I've seen this happen a few times. And um, I'll go through a couple of examples there. Um, I was working on a, a project that had some, some uh, GPS antennas in them, and they supplied the wrong antennas with them. Uh, we would require, there's two main types of antennas. There's passive and active ones, and they give us the wrong ones, uh, but they weren't marked in any way. So we had no idea that they had given us the wrong ones. And it means that the GPS could actually get a, a little bit of a signal, but not a lot of a signal. Um, so it would sometimes work, and it wouldn't really work well indoors, uh, which was really, really annoying. Um, I've also seen uh, boards which had crystals rotated 90 degrees on them. And so they sort of connected to the pins, but not quite. And it means that things would work and run at low speed. But once you tried to do things at a higher speed, uh, it wouldn't work. Um, and that, and because these, uh, these crystals are not quite square, but pretty close to square and quite small components, um, it was quite difficult uh, doing it. Um, I just saw a question there. That, that, Asked that I have experience on building shields for Adrenos. Yes, I certainly do. In fact, the lead shield that I showed earlier in the presentation was, a, was an Adreno shield. Um, and uh, the worst thing I ran into was an incorrect accelerometer circuit. Uh, the accelerometer, all of it worked, but it wouldn't return any values. And it was because one of the clock lines had been um, tied to uh, a, a high value. Um, and thus it would, it would it would power up. You could send commands to it. It spends responses back to you, but it wouldn't actually give you any acceleration data, which was really annoying. So one of the other things uh, you can do is uh, logging. Um, this will really help you with the debugging stuff. Just log everything that you can, and so you've got a good idea of what's going on in your hardware at any point of time. Um, you generally, the, the way to do this is you can't just have a log that keeps going forever. And uh, you'll have a circular log, and you, so you'll just have a, you know, the last things that are going through there. So um, and another good idea is just use an indicator lead to indicate the status. So don't annoy people, but you can like blink a version number when it starts up and blink some sort of status that's on, on there. There are some not some fun bits, uh, but I'm not going to go into those. And they include security, power issues, and over-the-air updates. That's I could fill up an entire talk with those. Um, so that's sort of been a little bit about my journey. And, um, and along the way, that I've, I've learned lots of new skills. I've met lots of nice people.
um, and I've been involved in a number of communities that, uh, that have grown and, and flourished. And I've made lots of personal co connections with the people in those communities. And I've had a lot of fun along the way. And I hope that your journey will be the same. So we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, five, in fact, I think. Well, not quite. Um, I see one question up there was that, uh, they're having trouble going to something to more professional. Um, it's just a matter of small steps. Um, it, it's it's not as hard as you think. Uh, once you get to something more complex, you're probably going to be using a real time operating system, and that makes things a lot easier for you. And it means you can do a lot of tasks at the same time. Um, so. Uh, a board that support for mobile networks. Yeah, there's a huge number of boards that, that support mobile networks. Um, I had a screenshot of a particle board before. Um, I quite like those. Uh, they they support uh, mobile networks and, and, and other networking uh, things as well. Um, I'm a really big fan of LoRaWAN, which is a, a, a wide area, low power network. Uh, okay, all right. Uh, I think I'm out of time. Chris wants to give his talk, and I shall join Chris afterwards for a beer. Thanks for coming by, and.